All right, so we, we left off yesterday talking about homo lumo interactions and how to perturb the homo or the lumo to either increase reactivity by putting a donor on the homo or an um, or adding a donor or an acceptor. And if you add a, a donor, then it's gonna increase the energy of the homo. If you add an acceptor, it's gonna decrease the energy of the, the lumo. All right, so we're gonna talk about a couple of things. We'll talk about these uh, pericyclic reactions uh, and I'll give you an example of that. Um, and then we're gonna work, work through a couple of problems on this problem set. All right, so let me, and we'll talk more about these pericyclic reactions. I'm gonna talk about uh, the electrocyclization and then the cycloaddition, and then we'll talk about sigmatropic uh, rearrangements on Monday. Um, but these are the three main types of pericyclic reactions, right? You got your cycloaddition reactions, you have uh, electrocyclizations, and then you have uh, sigmatropic uh, rearrangements. So we're gonna let me let me show you an example of the uh, uh, cycle addition. Let's start there. Hopefully, my Wi-Fi and everything will cooperate. All right. All right, so let's talk about uh, cyclo additions, and we're gonna we're gonna focus on the four plus two because I'm I'm sure that you can you remember that from uh, organic two, right? So one of the things again about MO theory is we're dealing with groups of molecular orbitals. That's one, and then the second part is we only care about uh, the homo and the lumo of a given species, right? Because that's how it's going to react. It's either going to react through its homo or through its LUMO. So if I do a, a simple uh, four plus two, I'm just gonna put a, a substituent there, right? And then this reacts in a pericyclic fashion. Right, what that means literally is that the electrons move in a circuit. And they only move over specific atoms. All right, so the electrons, they move in a circuit, they move over specific atoms. And here, and for the four plus two, you can see the electron flow is like so, right? So you have a uh, two new sigma bonds that's going to be formed in the in the product, and then the pop one of the pi bonds gets shifted over, right? So every every four plus two, right? Every four plus two, two cycle addition <coughs> is going to end with a six member ring. clean that up. All right, how many of you remember this from uh, organic two? Very vague. Okay. All right. It's okay. It's gonna come back. All right. So here's the here's the uh the reaction is the outcome. You always get a six member ring and you always get, um, you always get this, the same flow of electrons between these six atoms right here. Right, that's why we call it again, pericyclic. The electrons are only moving between those six atoms, right? And if you were to 
put the numbers in back in over here would be the same. Like so. All right. So when when this reaction occurs, right, the diene, which is on the on the left side, reacts through its homo. And then the dienophile, which is on the other side, reacts through its lumo. All right, so it's the homo of the diene and the lumo of the dienophile. What does that mean in terms of the molecular orbital considerations, right? Well, the homo of the diene, I'm just, I'm, I can draw out the whole system just so we don't have to worry about going back. The diene is a four pi system. So it's gonna have four molecular orbitals. And you can just, you don't have to write them all out. You can I'll just write out the homo, right? It's got four pi electrons, two here, two here, right? So you can already see that this is gonna be my homo. Sorry. Right, that's a node here. That's where, that's where the sign change comes from. And then on the bottom, they all are shaded on the top, right? Top lobe is shaded on all of them. <clears throat> and then up here, you got two nodes. And then here you have three, so the shading is going to alternate. All right, so this is the homo of the diene. And then your dienophile is a two pi system, right? It's only two pi electrons. So we can write that out like this. That all right, so this is the LUMO, all right? And, and so the reaction is going to take place between the HOMO of the diene and the LUMO of the dienophile, right? So when they interact, right, in a transition state, this is what is, this is what it's going to look like. So here is the, I'm going to change the color up. Here's the diene. Right, and then here's my dienophile. So the question is now, we know we got the homo lumo overlap. That's how the reaction is gonna happen. The question is with the dienophile, I'm gonna put the lobes in. If I wanted constructive overlap between these two <coughs> lobes right here, What's, what should I do to the lobe on the dienophile, that, that lobe on the far right? Should the top be shaded or unshaded? Uh, unshaded. All right. So he's saying the top should be unshaded. If this is unshaded, remember these orbitals are equations. And the shading, or if it's shaded or unshaded, that's the sign of the equation. If I overlap an unshaded lobe and a shaded lobe, they're gonna cancel each other out, right? That's that's what we call destructive overlap. So I want mm -hmm. this to be shaded so that it can overlap with that orbital. Right? Oh, okay. and following, and then over here, I want that to be unshaded because this this lobe is unshaded. So I always want I always want constructive overlap. 
when I'm overlapping orbitals. Right, so orbitals, in order for them to overlap properly, they gotta have the same sign. All right, that makes sense? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's my, that's the, this is what the transition state is gonna look like. Let me, I gotta move that because when I'm, Sorry about that. I need to move this because when I save this, that's gonna it's gonna get cut off if I don't. How did I cut that off? All right, so we need that we need that constructive overlap there. Now that reaction takes place no problem, right? You heat it up. Normally, you run a, a Diels Alder a, a four plus two in a, a slightly higher temperature, right? Somewhere like a hundred degrees or so. No problem. What happens? What do you think is going to happen? All right, what do you think is going to happen if we did this? Because this is all ground state. What do, you, what do you think is going to happen if we did this in the excited state? All right, so let's look at the, let me copy this. I, I'm not going to rewrite it. I'm old. I actually can't copy all of it. What do you think? What, what and what? What do I mean when I say the excited state? I think we talked about it uh, Monday. Just a little bit. All right. So I'm gonna take. Let me get rid of all that. Right, so what? So when we say excited state, what we mean is that we are now exposing this to UV radiation or light, right? What's gonna happen is I'm gonna excite up one electron to the next energy level. So now this becomes my new homo. Does that make sense? Um, can you repeat that one more time, Dr. Ursula? Yeah, so if I'm if I'm doing this in the excited state, that means I'm irradiating this with UV light. So heat is not going to cause electrons to jump energy levels, but UV excitation will, right? So if I if I irradiate this, which I have shown over here, I'm just hitting it with some UV light. I'm going to and then, and this is so. You have your diene and your dienophile in the same flask and you just basically shine a, a UV light on it to get the, to uh, run the reaction under these conditions, right? So I'm gonna excite up one electron to the next energy level. So I get a new homo. All right. And then on this side, I'm gonna do the same thing because they're both gonna get excited. <clears throat> Uh, does the direction of the arrow matter? Oh, you mean the spin on on it? Right. On the electron? Yeah. No, no, it doesn't. Yes. Okay. It doesn't. It does when they pair it up. But if they're unpaired, I could draw it up or down. It, it doesn't matter. Okay, it makes sense. All right. So now let's see what happens. Can we do the same reaction? Let's look back at the transition state. But in this case, the homo is going to be different, right? It's going to look like this. 
and I'm gonna oh I'm gonna react that with the Lumo. Is that right? Yep. Which is like that. Is that right? So shouldn't So you see how the overlap you can see the overlap can happen here, right? No problem. Right, but the second one. What about over here? It should be the bottom shaded, correct? Right, you can't do that. Right. So what would I have to do to the um the LUMO of the dying or the dying file in order to make that work. What would have to happen? I can write it out. So it looks like this. I would actually have to twist it. Right? Twist it around so that the one of those orbitals flips over not like that sorry about that so you have to actually have a twist occur in the diana file in order for that reaction to work and that's not going to happen it's too it's too high it takes too much energy for that to happen Right. So what we can conclude from that, based on the molecular orbital theory and based on the homo lumo interactions, is this. If you do a four plus two cycloaddition, you it's allowed under thermal conditions. Right, so under thermal conditions, right, the four plus two is allowed. Well, you saw that up top, right? When we just added heat, the transition state was fine. You got the proper orbital overlap, no problem. Here, you would have to actually twist the lumo of the dienophile to get those to get these two lobes to overlap right here and right here you have to twist it so that these two could overlap right does that make sense but 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 that takes so much energy that it is not going to happen so under photochemical conditions that's what that's when we irradiate not allowed All right so under photochemical conditions the four plus two is not allowed not allowed under thermal conditions it is but uh, and that's all based on molecular orbital theory and it's all based on the overlap between the homo and the lumo any questions about that? No. You sure? All right, let's do this. Let me um switch to what's this document right here. Let's look at can y'all see that document? Yes. Yeah. All on my screen. All right. So the question up here says, and this is the uh, first question on the problem set. It says, using frontier molecular orbital theory, explain why deals all the reaction between maleic and hydride and one three butadiene proceeds, <clears throat> but under similar uh, conditions, same temperature pressure. A reaction of ethylene with maleic anhydride does not. So I'm gonna see if I can 
copy this. Cut it. Let me see. I don't think that's a way to do that. So we, we're working under, <laughs> under thermal conditions. So it's all under thermal conditions, all right? So why would you expect their first reaction to proceed? based on the molecular orbital uh, considerations, right? The HOMO and LUMO, HOMO of the diene, LUMO of the dienophile. Uh, why, does it, why does that happen? Mm. Right. It, we, this is similar to what we just did, am I right? Under thermal conditions, what does the HOMO for that look like? Let me fix that up. That's sloppy. Still sloppy. I have yet to find the perfect stylus. When I do, I'm going to shout. All right, that's the homo, is that right? Mm -hmm. And then for maleic and hydride, for all of all of the other substituents and the carbonyls, it's still just a two-pi system, right? So the LUMO for that is gonna look like this. Are you following? So you can get that overlap in a transition state with no problem. What about the second example? Why do you think that's problematic? Is that a four plus two or would that be a two plus two? Two plus two. It's actually a two plus two, right? Uh -huh. And so what we what we need to look at is what the transition state would look like for that, for the two plus two. Like what, what the homo and the lumo would look like. So the HOMO for a two-pi system is going to look like this. Following? This is the HOMO. The LUMO is going to look like this. Could we get those to overlap in a transition state under, under these conditions? No. No. You can't get you'll get constructive overlap on one side, but you can't get it on both sides without some type of twist happening. Right? You got constructive overlap here, but on this side, it's destructive. Right? The only way to get that overlap to be proper is to do a twist in the LUMO or in the HOMO. And it's not going to happen. It's very difficult for that to happen. Are y'all following that? Yes. Right. Let's let me go back to here. I want to. How could we make that happen? Could we do it um, in the excited state? Let's see what that would look like. So for the ground for the two plus two the, in the ground state, the thermal under thermal conditions is not allowed. All right, but if we did the excited state,
right? If I react it, right now I have a, I don't really have a LUMO, but it's the two high energy um, orbitals that's going to react. So could we do that? If this is what the transition state looks like. Oh, sorry about that. Yes. Yeah. So what can we say about the two plus two? Under which conditions is it allowed? It's under thermal or photochemical conditions. Photochemical. It's allowed under photochemical conditions and it's disallowed under thermal conditions. So does the photo um, condition just mean a higher interstate energy mm -hmm. state? Okay. Yeah, because when you shine again, when you shine light on the system, it's going to irradiate that system and it's going to excite an electron from one energy level to the next. You can heat a system all day. It's not. It's not going to provide enough energy to uh, excite an electron because it's a different type of energy. All right. Are we okay? Does that make sense? Right. So for that yes. first question, when it asks about frontier molecular orbital theory, that's what it's talking about: homo lumo interactions between pi systems. All right, uh, let's look at number two. What do you think about number two? And how would you explain why uh, amides and esters are planar functional groups using molecular orbital theory? And, and to give, give it some clarity, let me put in Come on, style, let's do right. The long pairs. What do you think? How would you draw? Uh, well, let me not say that. How would you classify an amide and an ester when we're talking about uh, pi systems? Remember, we did two pi, we did a lily, uh, then we did the four pi. And six pi, how would you classify that? All right, let's go back to, um, let me go back to the PowerPoint. Would an amide or ester be considered like one of these allylic systems? Would it be like this one right here or this one? They seem similar to me. Yeah, they are. <laughs> An ester would be considered allylic just like this. And so would an amide. So if, if you had to put the p orbitals in, right, there's one of your lone pairs. And then the other one is going to be perpendicular. But we don't care about that because it can't overlap. But the other p orbitals are going to overlap here. Right there. Um, Dr. Russ, are you pointing yeah, at something? Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. My bad. I need to do a new share. My bad. Let 
that's coming up. All right. You can you see down the bottom where I have the, the Esther? Yes. All right. So this is this is uh Austin in here. All right, so that Esther is going to look like that. I'm going to draw the R group. The R group will be out here because it's, it will be uh, it's SP2, so it will be 120, 120 degrees. But you can see that with the Esther, right, the P orbital zone, the one with the one long pair on oxygen, and then the, uh, that should be one electron in there too. All right, the P orbitals in the long pair on oxygen, it's coming. It's, it's a, there's been a lag with this all morning. And then the pi bond on the carbonyl are all gonna overlap, all right? Anytime you get orbital overlap like that in, in a conjugated type system, it's gonna drop the energy of that system. Sometimes as much as uh, five kilocalories per, per mole. Right, so for the ester, that's what the pi system looks like. For the amet, it's not going to be much different. Right, you got a long pair here, and then in your pi system on your carbonyl, it's going to look like that. Right, so again, the reason why is why they're planar is to maintain that orbital overlap between the nitrogen and the amide or the oxygen and the ester and the pi system, the carbonyl pi system. Right, you want to maintain that. Right, in, any questions about that? Let me write that down here. So that planarity is going to maintain your overlap. Orbital overlap makes any system more stable, right? If you got good orbital overlap, especially P orbital overlap, it's going to stabilize that system and drop the energy. So that's why that that's the explanation as to why amides and esters are planar is because you get that uh, three p orbital overlap, right? And you form like this, you form an allylic type pi system. All right, questions about that or questions about MO theory, period. All right, <laughs> let's look at number three. I'm going to give you some time to think about that. It says enolates react through either the oxygen or the carbon indicated below, but never through the central carbon. Why not? And what, what molecular, what um, pi system can we compare enolate to to explain that? Anybody? Okay, so let's let's draw that out. The enolate looks like this. Right, so oxygen has a negative charge and three lone pairs.
all right? And then I'm just gonna write the CH3 over here. How would you draw the pi system for that? If you had to draw the molecular orbitals for it, what, 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 what class would it fall into? Is it a lilic? Is it true pi? Is it a regular four pi system? Like what class would it fall into? All right, so it's actually it's actually an allylic system. And again, if it's allylic, it's gonna have the same sets of molecular orbitals, right? It's gonna have a three p orbitals because you're gonna have if we drew this out in a planar fashion. Like that. You got four pi electrons and three p orbitals. So you're going to have three molecular orbitals. Is that right? And then which one of those would be the homo? Because that's what it's going to react through since the since enolates are nucleophilic, it's going to react through the homo. So which one is going to be the homo? Looks like the second one, I guess. Yeah, it's got to be, right? Homo is highest occupied molecular orbital. Is that right? So the second right. is the highest energy orbital that has electrons in it. All right. So because it's the because that's the homo. Uh oh. Sorry about that. All right. That's where your reaction is going to take place. So read the question and tell me why it'll never react through the central carbon. Look at the molecular orbitals and, and tell me. Um, there don't appear to be any orbitals there. There's no orbital. Uh, it, get, it gets canceled, right? Right. Because if you think about <clears throat> the molecular orbitals and you think about them using like the theory of a standing wave, right? You got a no nose here and then it passes through zero once here, right? So with that being said, the central carbon, it, it doesn't go away, but the orbital from a molecular orbital standpoint, you can't react through that carbon because the orbital is canceled, right? In the molecular orbital diagram. So that's how you explain why you can't react through that uh, central carbon. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. What about the last question? It says acrolein is more reactive with nucleophiles than formaldehyde. And the question is why? They're both carbonyls. All right. Mm, yeah. The extra pi system. Okay. What what does that do? What what do you what do you um so the double bond on acrylin, you're saying attaching that to the carbonyl, what what should it do based on molecular orbital theory? Now we're talking about uh, adding a, a donor or an acceptor, is that right? Mm -hmm. 
So what's going to happen to the reactivity? Why does the reactivity of acrolein increase when you add that extra uh, alkene, that pi system? Mm -hmm. You're right. You were right, Sam, when you said that. But why does that increase the reactivity? Is it because it pushes it to a higher energy state? Is it, will it take it higher or lower? It lowers the LUMO, right? Right. It will lower the energy of both the HOMO and the LUMO. They both have to come down, right? But when that happens, then that's how you increase reactivity by lowering the energy of the, the HOMO and the LUMO. But it's the LUMO that's going to react with a nucleophile, not the HOMO. Right? Is that right? Come on. Right, that's that. That's what we were talking about on Monday. That when you can perturb the home or the lumo by adding in certain substituents, and so if you want to drop, if you want to make it more reactive towards nucleophiles, then you want to add an electron withdrawing group. If you want to make it more reactive towards electrophiles, then you want to add uh, a donor, a donating group to raise the energy of the homo. But the but you want to if you want to make it react better with nucleophiles, then you want to lower the energy of the LUMO, right? All right, any any questions about anything? Man, time went by fast. So when we come off Friday, why don't, why don't we do, um, each of you find a paper or publication. Let me, matter of fact, let me give you uh, let me do that. I'll tell you what to look for, and then you can find it. <clears throat> Come on, man. This dog is killing me with all this smacking. Oh, my God. Bruh, chill. All right, so I want I want one of you to find a uh, publication on um, electrocyclization. Um, Danishevsky's dying. That's the second one. Since it's, and it's um, uh, and Clay's a real range. So those are the three topics. Just email me and let me know which one you're taking. And just one paper. It can be a, a recent paper. It doesn't matter what journal it's from. But uh, we can use that to piggyback on what we've been talking about with uh, with this molecular orbital theory. So Danishevsky's dying. You'll see if you Google that, you'll get a lot of hits. Uh, Clays and rearrangement and electrocyclization. You won't, you'll get hits either way. Or you can put it in the chat, which one you want to take. And then on Friday, we'll start out with that. Each of you take a few minutes and then we'll take the paper that whatever you present and we'll kind of um, walk it down. As a matter of fact, once you find something, just email it to me so I can look over it before Friday too, so we can have some point of discussion. Okay. I'm a, I'm, let, me, let me narrow that down. Uh, Trienes. All right, so uh, electrocyclization with trienes, not just any, because it's, it's, that's a pretty broad topic. And then Danishevsky's dying and Clayson rearrangement. 
let's see what we can what we can work on work on uh friday okay all right thank y'all all right thank you